on behalf of First Baptist Church, on behalf of the Beeman family, I'd like to welcome you here as we celebrate the passing of Miss Pat Beeman. Now, I don't use that word lightly to say that we celebrate, because if there's ever a lady who we know now is in the presence of her precious Lord, it's Miss Pat. And so we rejoice with that. This, these are, are difficult times for family, but oh my, when you, when you know where your mom is, what a, what a blessing that she's given you. And she prepared the way uh, in so many ways, prepared her own funeral in so many ways by having all the details lined out. And one of those details was to have a song, a couple of songs that she'd already planned for. And uh, this, one, this first one is what she wanted to sing, have sung is Serenaded by Angels. She went to sleep one night Never here to awake again But everything was alright Between her and him So she awoke in heaven's courtyard Free from pain within Round her, and they took her by the hand, serenaded by angels, up to the throne, serenaded by angels, finally at home, surrounded by praises. at night and I try to imagine that city of brilliant light waiting for me but my mind cannot conceive so I'll continue to dream until I'm transformed Serenaded by angels up to the throne, serenaded by angels, finally home, surrounded by praises to the King. Welcome to paradise. Serenaded by angels up to the throne, surrounded by angels, finally home, surrounded by praises to the King. Welcome to paradise. Welcome you to this memorial service for Evelyn Pat Patterson Beeman. Solomon, at the end of his life, wrote in Ecclesiastes that there's a time for everything. And he went through an entire litany of things for which there's a time. And for Pat, that time to be born was April the 27th, 1928, in West Virginia. And sure, surely there's a time for her to laugh and do other things uh, with four brothers and with a sister. There's a time for her to get, and she got for herself a husband, Tom, 50 years of marriage. If 
fact, uh, Jan and I were just discussing that we've been married, uh, this April will be 32 years. And she said, do you think you'll live long enough for it to be 50 years? I said, I don't know, you're a hard woman to live with. <laughs> but, you know, we were actually discussing any more these days, 50-year marriages are becoming increasingly rare, aren't they? And it's a real testimony whenever we find someone who, who mar was married for, for half a century. What a blessing. <coughs> There's a time for her to rejoice. Uh, four daughters, Lisa and Bill, Eve and David, Bonnie and Mike, and then an infant daughter. Three sons, Matt and Bobby, Jeff and Yvette, John and Dawn. Time to dance. Numerous grandchildren and great-grandchildren. In fact, I was reading down that list, and what a blessing. What a great posterity. Grandchildren, step-grandchildren, great-grandchildren, step-great-grandchildren. There's a time for her to mourn and to cry. Surely the deaths of her infant daughter, of uh, her daughter Bonnie. I was talking to Mike earlier, and he, uh, he introduced himself not as a son-in-law, but as a son. And what a great testimony to a mother that she would embrace her son-in-law as a son. Her husband, Tom, her parents, Charles and Lucy, four brothers. Then there came a time for Pat to die. And that time was Sunday, March the 11th, 2012 at 2.30 p.m. And we've come to a time in order to remember. Uh, one of the favorite portions of scripture that, were, that was mentioned is perhaps one of the best known and, le and yet least known where it is, scriptures in all of the word of God. Because as I begin to read to you from Psalm 84, you're going to recognize quite a bit of this. And yet you probably didn't know that's where it was found. Listen to the word of God. How lovely are thy dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in thy house. They are ever praising thee. And then we find that little word, selah. It's a musical term. It means to pause. But I remember hearing John Phillips say many years ago that in essence what the psalmist is saying, now there, what do you think about that? Then the psalmist continues. How blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the highest or the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, that would be the valley of weeping, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. What do you think about that? Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in the courts in thy courts, is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man or the woman who trusts in thee. I didn't have the privilege of knowing Pat so long, only a couple of years, but in these couple of years, she's really impressed me in, in such a great way. There are three words that come to mind whenever I think of my sweet sister, Pat, and that's pretty much the way I greeted her every time I saw her. I would just say, hi, sweet Pat, how are you today? She would just grin. The first word that came to mind was the word faithfulness. Because she was so faithful to her church, first of all. Well, really, I guess we should say faithful to her Lord, first of all. And then that resulted in a faithfulness to the church and to his people. 
You could count on Pat. You could count on her when she was able to do something. You could count on her when she wasn't able to do something. Somehow she would dig deep within herself and find the ability to do that. Uh, this past Sunday we were we rejoiced in having uh, one of our members that has not been able to come back with us for the last two weeks he's been back. And I made the comment then that whenever people are looking for an excuse not to be in worship, <laughs> Well, then, men like this man was overcoming obstacles to be in worship. And it was the same way with Pat. There are times after she became infirmed and really didn't need to be driving and didn't need to be on the road, and she would show up, and I would be thankful that she was here, and I would pray that she would get home. <laughs> but yet, you've got to admire her commitment to want to be in the house of worship with the saints. Faithfulness. The second was joy. Now, how do you know whether you have joy as opposed to happiness? And, and the key way is this. When you're in the fire, when you suffer, when you encounter difficulty, if it remains, it's joy. And if it flees, it was happiness. It wasn't true joy. Pat's demeanor never changed. She was as pleasant on a good day as she was on a difficult day. The smile was the same on a good day as a difficult day. And I remember one poignant moment where I had visited her in the hospital in Baton Rouge and no one was around, the light was off, I almost hated to go in the room, but it was the only chance that week I would have to see her. And so I broke a rule. I went in and I awakened her and we began to talk. And this big smile came across her face and she said, I just want you to know that I'm fine, that I'm okay. I remember sharing with her, as I share with all of you, whenever you've been hospitalized or if you're in a nursing home or wherever you are, I would share with you, now remember, you're a missionary here. You'll see people you will never see again. And you'll have an opportunity to show them how a Christian deals with difficulty. And so don't blow it. This is your great opportunity to let Christ shine through you. And I'll never forget that night that she said to me, you know, there's a nurse here on the floor that I've been able to be a missionary to that's going through hardship. And I've had an opportunity to pray with her, to encourage her. And she said, you know, could we pray for her right now? And we just stopped what we were doing and we prayed for that nurse, for her to see the beauty of Jesus and flee to him. What a great gal. I mean, here's a time whenever we should be praying for her, whenever she should be receiving, and instead she's pouring her heart out with the joy of the Lord, thinking and ministering about others. I mean, she almost lost her breath and passed out while we were praying. And yet with her final breath, it would have been thinking of someone else. Joy. Third word I think of was simply this, the word worship. I had an opportunity to talk to Miss Pat about this, and we talked about what worship was. And I told her this story that I had heard years ago about a very famous preacher who went with one of his Plymouth Brethren friends to worship one Sunday. And so when he got there... Well, then uh, the, the men arrived at sunup to begin to pray in the building, and then the women and children would come later in, in, in the morning. And so the men bowed and they prayed, and eventually he could hear the shuffle of feet in the building. And uh, as, uh, as he did, well, then he leaned over to his friend and he said, when does the service begin? And his friend leaned back and said, when the worship ends. This famous preacher who, if I called your name, you, his name, you would all know him. This famous preacher said, I was taught something that day by that simple Plymouth Brethren brother. That indeed our life is worship. Worship isn't something that we gather merely together to do on the Lord's Day, but our life is worship. And so one night I was talking to Miss Pat and I said, Miss Pat, we really miss you. And she says, well, I miss you all too, but don't think because I'm not there that I'm not in worship. And so this simple, small woman schooled me and reminded me again. And so as we bow this morning, I'm reminded that indeed I hope that the Lord would give me a heart like David's, 
A heart like Pat's to recognize that one day in the courts of the Lord would be better than a thousand years elsewhere. Father, we're thankful for the testimony of Pat. We recognize that she was a swell lady, but yet we realize that that was really Christ in her. We understand that there's no good thing in us except the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that he shone so brightly through her life. Father, she has set a high standard for us of faithfulness, of joy, and of worship. And I pray that each of us would not merely seek to attain that standard, but to exceed it as we seek to be pleasing to our Savior. I pray now for the family. During this time, I ask that your Holy Spirit would be near and dear to them like no other time. I pray that they would recognize, as David did, that, that you became very present to him as he moved through the valley of the shadow of death. And I pray that in these days ahead, that the sweetness of your Holy Spirit will sweeten their lives, will draw them near, will comfort them in the very moment of need. Father, that's our simple prayer this morning in Christ's name. Amen.